I mentioned last week so many times when you turn on the news and you read negative things about the church today. You read that there are churches closing. You read that there are churches who are denying Christ. You're reading that there are churches who are more concerned with looking like the world than they are looking like Jesus. And that's a shame. But don't let that drag you down. You know, the church is alive and well. People are coming to Christ in record numbers. And uh, I believe God still has His hand on us here on this side of the pond. Lord, we see things happening in Europe. We see things happening in Asia. We see things happening in Africa. We see things happening in South America. And we are going to continue to see things happen right here in North America as well. But it takes all of us who just take God at His word. Take God at His word and go in love and share the gospel with those who need to hear. But there's no doubt that there are times, oh, before I forget, you have bulletins, that little tear off. If, if you consider this your church, maybe you're kind of new here, but you've kind of been coming long enough and you go, you know, I think this is where I want to land. Would you fill out that information so we can call you and pester you? No, not at all. So, just so we can have your contact information, when, when there's something comes up that maybe isn't scheduled, uh, we have a phone bite system. If you don't mind being on that, it just sends an automated voicemail uh, about certain things that are happening. We'd love to know how to get in touch with you. Uh, so if you take a minute, fill that out. Also, the other side of that tear-off is a, a prayer request, something that you need, you want to call, a pastoral call or a visit or something like that, you've got to work through, please give us your information, and that way uh, we can better serve you. All right. We do sometimes wonder today, who can you believe? Who can I believe? How do we know who's telling the truth? How do we discern false teachers? Who can we trust? And you may find yourself saying, I, I just don't know who to believe anymore. Well, you know, that could be maybe politics. Good example. Groucho Marx said, politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. <laughs> or it may be with the church. Maybe you've had a bad experience. Maybe you've been the victim of abuse by clergy or other church members, and you might start thinking, you know, they're just all the same. Just all the same. Why bother? Uh, we have a conference that we're sponsoring coming up on May 20th here for armor bearers. It's uh, those who, to, to pour into those who pour into others. And uh, somebody on the Facebook ad said, all the churches today are about politics and power. And uh, I thought, well, I'm sorry that that's been your experience, but that's not what we're about. But you can understand that some people might get a bad taste in their mouth. Truth is, there have been false teachers targeting the church ever since before the close of New Testament Scripture. This is nothing new. There have always been false teachers. I, I've met Christians who live in fear of the counterfeit, almost to the point of not wanting to even belong to a church or, or some extreme cases even leave the house because they're just convinced that everybody is a false teacher. They're worried they're going to miss the rapture or the get led astray by Antichrist, that they're somehow going to just lose their salvation and and that they think God is just waiting to catch them at something. It's just an unhealthy view of God and an unnecessary anxiety. As followers of Jesus, we don't have to fear and worry. We don't have to. We don't have to fear about falling into the trap of false teachings if we simply refuse to neglect our relationship with God. Just follow Jesus. Stay close. Don't get off to the side. The only person that can make you lose your salvation is you. If one day you wake up and say, I don't believe Jesus is the only way. 
And that doesn't usually happen overnight or because of a bad burrito the night before. <laughs> the enemy of our soul wants us to be uneasy about these things. He's a loser. Yes, he is. <laughs> He's a defeated foe. Yes, he is. He's all talk. Yeah. Don't give him more power than he has. Yeah. His primary battle is right here. And we are to take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Yeah. Famous 20th century British re revivalist that I like to quote a lot, one of my favorites, Leonard Ravenhill. He said, I've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and two-thirds of heaven's angels on my side. What do you expect me to do, sit down and cry? Yeah. We don't have to be helpless, folks. Amen. We don't have to live in fear. But it's our responsible our responsibility to know how to respond to all of the voices that are surrounding us. Because God wants us to grow up, right? He wants us to be mature in Christ. Yes. So we should be prepared to uh, mature our own selves so that we can uh, guide those who are immature in the faith. And so many of the New Testament books are about what we have to understand about who we are in Christ, like that song we started with this morning, and how we can help those who are more immature in the faith. And think about when the New Testament is being written and these letters are being written, right? This was brand new. It didn't have 66 books bound into this thing that we call the Bible. And the letters that were being shared by those who followed Jesus, those who walked with Him, and those who experienced Him, the apostles and others, were, were the, the Scripture that these new believers were reading. People themselves became what people, other people would read to learn about Jesus. And really, it hasn't much changed. It hasn't much changed. We're, we're called to represent Jesus, right, in everything that we say and that we do. We're called to represent Jesus and how we act and react to things that are going on around us. And if we're walking around in a panic state thinking that everybody and their brother is a false teacher, not only are we being critical of everybody, which I, social media, you know, you've seen it. Don't get me started. Not only are we being critical, we're scaring those who are young in the faith. We're scaring those who really have not yet learned what it means to be secure in Christ. Well... We have the written Word of God. We have it today. It's, it's survived years and years. It's, re, it's survived revisions. It's survived uh, language translations. The language we read in today didn't even exist when the original manuscripts were written. But God has preserved it. Now we have it in apps. We have it printed. We have it on the Internet. It's so readily available. There's never been a time in history that the Word of God is more available than it is now. And there's probably never been a time in history that there are more people that come to the building with pews and a steeple that are more ignorant of the Word of God than right now. You don't have to be. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, the author of His Word, right? He, he authored it through men who wrote 40 men over a period of 1,500 years. Is What we have is what we know as the 66 books of the Bible, the, the, the canon of Scripture. And the Holy Spirit confirms His Word. You know, you cannot be born again without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit Himself is the agent that convicts us of our need of a Savior. And, and it's only by regeneration by the Holy Spirit that we can be born again. Once you're born again, that same Holy Spirit will will come and fill you to overflowing. To, you can be operating in the gifts and, and in ways beyond anything you've ever imagined or dreamt possible. And we have that. I would say that believers in Christ have an awful lot going for them. Wouldn't you? So when we get troubled by what we see around us, let's get back to the basics. Let's get back to the original. Uh, you know, sometimes everything has to be new and improved. We're not satisfied with just the way it's always been. And, and there is new revelation that doesn't change the Word of God. So we always want to be open to these things, uh, as long as it does not con you know, contradict Scripture. 
But for the most part, let's understand that old and the same isn't necessarily a bad thing. People get bored with the old. Let's never get bored with the truth of the Word of God. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he told them that if someone came to you and preached another Jesus, you'd run right after him. He was telling them, look, you're so immature. And this, this was a group of people that were, were genuinely used in the gifts of the Spirit, but they were immature. Their, their sanctification needle was at about one. <laughs> and he says, listen, you guys are so fickle. You believe everything that comes down the pike. Don't do that. You can't get more original <laughs> than the Word of God. And as we look into this series, it's hard to get more original than the Apostle John. The last of the Mohicans, so to speak. The last apostle to die. The only apostle to die a normal death, even though he was persecuted. Specifically, 1 John. Over the next five weeks or so, we're going to walk through 1 John. And I want you to consider the author. Here's one who walked with Jesus. Here's one who witnessed his miracles. Here's one who was part of the dynamic three, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus pulled aside to teach and, and to involve them in some things that maybe the others weren't quite ready for. Here's the Apostle John living in Ephesus, probably an old man by the time he wrote these three epistles that bear his name, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He had written the Gospel of John, and he also wrote the book of Revelation. It's, it's supposed around the same time. Imagine, here he is, he's getting old. He's starting to see things happening, and he thinks, you know what, I better write this down. I, I'm fully convinced that the authors of the Gospels and of the epistles thought that Jesus was coming again in their lifetime. I think that's clear from the way that we th see things that are written. And, and Jesus didn't say when, did he? And I believe as the reason that they wrote things down as they started getting older is they realized, you know what? My eschatology may be wrong. And, and I better write this down because I want other people to know the truth. And in John's case, there was a group of people that, that had pulled out from the church that were teaching some heresies. And he wanted to go on record and make sure that people were not led astray. Written for this specific reason, these people, these false teachers, that even though they had withdrawn from the church, they were still causing a stir. And you have young believers. You know, they couldn't talk about grandma's church because they didn't have a church. We're talking before the close of the first century. And the group of people that had withdrawn and were teaching some very different things, they had a unique view of Jesus. And this group continued to grow. And many people believe it was the beginning of Gnosticism. The Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. It's where we get Gnostic. And it, it speaks of knowledge. And they had a, they had a, a hyperinflated view of themselves that I'm smarter than you, therefore I understand more than you. And John says, wait a minute, you weren't even there. I was there. And he's going on record. Now, if it's the beginning of the Gnostics, they still exist today, of course. They weren't open enemies against God, but they had a, a, a different understanding of who they thought Jesus was. They didn't deny Christ they just thought they were smarter and had more knowledge uh, to bring to the table, more illumination than the apostles, of which John was the last. Some people worship knowledge itself. You make an idol of education. Nothing wrong with education. We should all educate ourselves. But when you have the attitude that I'm smarter than you, and John's going, excuse me, don't try this at home. <laughs> right? Let me tell you, I was there. He was the only one that stayed at the cross, at the foot of the cross. 
<laughs> the Gnostics didn't believe that the historical accounts and the moral teachings of Jesus were to be taken literally. They didn't believe that the physical mattered all that much. Only the spirit was important. And actually, to be fair, there are two extremes of Gnosticism. One is uh, licentiousness. Since the physical doesn't matter, sexual immorality was no big deal. Uh, the physical doesn't matter, so it's just a spiritual thing. Uh, you know, you, you say that you follow Jesus and live any way you want. It doesn't happen anymore, does it? And then you have the opposite view, asceticism, right, that says that the physical is so unimportant that I'm going to deny the physical body anything that it needs. And they thought that if they, if they abused themselves and, and would deny themselves any pleasure or deny themselves anything good, that somehow that made them more holy. But we don't have that anymore either, do we? No, I think we do. And most of them did not believe that Jesus was in a physical body when he was crucified. That somehow the son left because they couldn't imagine God creating a physical being that would then be killed. So they denied the need for atonement. Since there was really no evil or sin, kind of convenient, huh? If Christ had no body, well, then it really wasn't important that he died. However, if Christ bodily rose from the dead, then the body is important. And John wanted to be sure that the church was equipped to deal with this new threat to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there was ever a man for the job, it was John. He was an eyewitness to every part of Jesus' life and ministry. He was an eyewitness to his death. He was an eyewitness to his resurrection. Epistle of 1 John is what they call a general epistle. In other words, it was circular. It was not written to a particular group of people like some of Paul's letters were, you know, the Galatians, the churches in Galatia, the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. This was a, a general uh, epistle. And there's no mention of authorship in 1 John. But Polycarp, who was a first century uh, disciple of John, John actually, not biblical, uh, it's extra biblical information, his history, is that John actually uh, placed Polycarp as Bishop of Smyrna. So, uh, Polycarp didn't mention him in his writings, but Irenaeus, another church father, who was kind of a disciple of Polycarp, said yes, and he and others said yes, Polycarp was a disciple of John. So those are early testimonies to the validity of the authorship of this book. That makes us feel confident, right? That we're reading it from himself, the, 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 the guy himself. So look at 1 John. Uh, with a focus on equipping ourselves to stay the course, stay true to the gospel, and to not be led astray by false teachers. And listen, the more you understand the issues that the early church was facing in John's day, the better you'll be able to identify false teaching today. Our foundation and our go-to has to be the Word of God that has stood the test of time. The Word of God that the Apostles and the early church fathers gave their life to defend. This is why we base everything on what the Word of God says. We have to be equipped on a foundational level. It's better than making a list of who to trust and who not to trust, because that's going to change every other day. Or depending on what somebody thinks, right? Somebody's opinion. Not every teacher has it all together. Not every teacher has it all wrong. Not everyone is out to get you. So we have to kind of come at this with a, a, an open mind to be informed by the Word of God. Last week, I said we started this series off with an effort to not, us, not get us critical, to not have a critical view that everyone who's different is wrong. And that seems to be the world in which we live, even among Christians. And it, it really upsets me when I hear people say, well, it's different. It's a, you think people don't say stuff about us? <laughs> These crazy Pentecostals, you know? Oh, I hear stuff 
that they don't know who I am, they're, and they're misinformed. But people take a little bit of knowledge and run with it. And there's got to be a reason. I don't know why that reason is. It does something for them. But let's not get caught in the trap of being critical of things that we do not understand. Sometimes it looks different, right? Sometimes it's just different, not evil. Other times it looks good, but it's wrong. And we need to be able to identify. So the purpose of this whole series is to learn to live our lives so authentically before God that we need not fear the counterfeit. So we start today in 1 John chapter 1. And we're just going to look at verses 5 through 10. Uh, we, won't, we won't cover every verse in 1 John, but I will tell you, it's not that long of a book. I encourage you to read ahead. Re- read the entire letter of 1 John uh, toward the back of your book, right? First and Second Peter, John 1, John 2, John 3, Jude, Revelation. So if you're not sure where it is, start in Revelation and work backwards and you'll find 1 John, not to be confused with the Gospel of John. So we'll look at verses 5 through 10 today. Uh, today I'm using the NIV. Uh, you can follow along in whatever flavor you have, or if on here, it's all the same. I talked to a guy one time that said, uh, I said something about, I had a Bible on here, and he, I'll stick to this. It's the same one, you know. Anyway, that was a little side, side trip. All right, here we go. 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, that we make Him out to be a liar, and His Word is not in us. These verses have the distinction of standalone verses. So, it's often not a good idea to just open up the Bible and go like this, and make that apply to you or to your situation. I mean, the Word of God is alive, but there's wisdom in knowing the context, right? These verses stand alone, and, and if we just took them and allowed them to stand alone, they would nurture us, they would help us, they would guide us, no doubt about it. But when we consider what they meant in John's day, and, and why he was motivated to write this letter in the first place, it has a whole lot more impact for us, especially when we consider who to believe, who not to believe, what passes for biblical doctrine, what does not. And when we understand that, that the issues that he was intending to address in the first place, boy, it makes all, all, the, all the difference. The, the joke, a friend of mine used to have the joke that said some people pick and choose and they put different stuff together and make it say what they want. Right. You know, like, like Judas went and hung himself, go thou and do likewise. Just, oh, it doesn't work that way. That's not a scripture verse, by the way. That's a couple put together. Uh, just in case you didn't know that. So let's look at these one verse at a time. Verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. And he uses we, we, meaning the apostles, those who walked with Jesus. We have heard from him. Jesus is the issue. The false teachers here were removing this dual nature of Jesus, right? They they couldn't get their, their... brains around fully God and fully man. And I'm not saying that I can really quite get my brain around that. But if he wasn't fully God and fully man, he could not be propitiation for our sins. Right? If if he didn't live a perfect life in a physical body, then he would not have been qualified to pay the penalty of sin. Really, what they were doing was preaching another Jesus. They were preaching another Jesus. 
He said, this is the message. And what, what's that mean? This letter that we call 1 John. This is the message. He says, I was there. I saw with my eyes. I heard with my ears. I saw his death. I was there at the cross when he died. I saw his resurrection. resurrection. I outran Peter to get to the tomb. He says, trust me, you can believe me firsthand. I was there. I know what I'm talking about. He says, God is light. It speaks to his nature. He didn't say he is the light or is a light. He said he is light. That means that, that he is everything that we need to, to navigate our way through a dark world. He's pure. He's the standard of holiness. It kind of sounds like what he wrote in John chapter 3 when he says, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Also from the Gospel of John in chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, he writes of Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He says, God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. There's some absolutes here. Huh? We don't like absolutes in our culture today and in our world. We like choices, 47 different types of brake shoes and stuff like that, you know. We take all these choices. But with, here's an absolute. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And then he goes on in verse 6. Are we doing okay? Amen. Just kind of kind of quiet. I don't want you to go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out of the truth. You want to be able to say that you have fellowship with God? You can't claim that and walk in darkness. You can't make some statement that says, well, you know, I repeated that prayer and I'm going back to life as usual. It doesn't work that way. That's not the Christian life and experience. Much to many people's chagrin. You can't claim that you're following Jesus and walk in darkness. Why? Because he's not there. <laughs> he's not there. If you're walking in darkness and claiming to be where God is, you're lying. It's that one foot in heaven, the other in hell situation. You know, there comes a time that's just not going to work for you. It's impossible. John says, look, God's rule is not mine. God is light. These false teachers were living on the dark side, and they were claiming that, that they were living for Jesus and that they were following Jesus. You know, you can't live like hell and claim heavenly citizenship. They claim to higher consciousness, smarter than you, smarter than everybody else. They had the real scoop on Jesus, not what you lowly Galileans had. John says, no. If you want to claim fellowship with God, you've got to walk in the light. And that's a great segue to verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies from all sin. Fellowship, it's more than a meal. <laughs> fellowship in the church, the koinonia, that means we're concerned about one another. When we walk in the light, those of us who walk in the light together, we enjoy that sweet fellowship with one another, where it's more than just, how are you doing? Good. Nice to see you. Great. It's let we invest ourselves in one another yeah. because we have something in common. We're all walking in the light of Christ. And there are two blessings from staying in the light. That one is that fellowship. That's one of the blessings. Uh, the, the other one is that th th this wasn't just uh, what we do here. It speaks to the fact that when we walk in the light, that we have forgiveness of sin, and we have a brand new life, and we have a home in heaven. The blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Amen. I don't know if anybody here has tried to purify yourself from your sin. If you've just tried to be good, 
and, and you've just tried to say all the right things and do all the right things and not say all the wrong things and not do all the wrong things, and you get to the end of that frustrating life, and you say, Jesus, help me. And you find out that there's a change that he makes when you come to him. And we say, hallelujah, because without Jesus, I just can't be good. I just can't be good. False teachers weren't just expressing preferences. I think some people today express their preference as the only way. They get their preference mixed up with Jesus. These false teachers were not talking about music style and color of carpet and version of the Bible. (laughs) They were denying the very nature of God. They were diminishing what was the only and still is the only 200% fully God and fully man. This was not a preference thing. When we stay in Christ and we remain in Christ, we can have freedom like we've never experienced before. These false teachers were saying the atoning work of Christ on the cross was not necessary. John said, oh, no, really? (laughs) No, he had a literal body. He died a literal death. He rose in a literal, physical resurrection. John probably could tell stories about, man, oh man, those 40 days that we walk with him in his resurrected body. 40 days. Let me tell you some stories. Let me tell you how he, 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 the naysayers had nothing to say when he took that piece of fish and actually ate it. The naysayers said, oh, it had to be something of God when he would just simply show up and appear among them, but yet he could be touched. John was there. He said, no, no, the physical is important. And verse 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verses 8, 9, and 10 here, they, they describe what's involved in walking in the light. It talks a lot about staying there. It's not a one-time thing. We don't come into the light of God and say, there, did it. No, it's where we're supposed to live. It's where we're supposed to have our hope. And our life should be in the light of God. God is light. We stay there for fellowship. We stay there to be uh, a fellowship with, with other believers and also with him. If you say you have no sin, he says you, <laughs> you just don't know the truth. Did I the need of forgiveness? Yeah. We're, we're, in a, we're in a political season, aren't we? Yeah. And I don't like it at all. I don't, well... There's a particular politician that I won't mention his name, but it starts with T and ends with rump. But he said one time, he may be the best president for us, I don't know, but what bothered me one time is he was interviewed, and they said, have you ever asked for forgiveness? And he said, oh, I can't think of a time that I have. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I know we're not electing a pastor, but if any of us think that we, maybe I'll regret sharing that. I don't know. No, you don't. Okay. Okay. I I mean, I may vote for him, but I still not too thrilled. Anyway, here's the thing. If we deny that we need forgiveness, we're fooling ourselves. When we think we're too smart to need forgiven, we're fooling ourselves. He's writing this to believers in Christ. He's writing this to the church. He's writing this to people who are born again. He's writing this to people who have, have come to Christ or else they would not be bothered by what these false teachers were doing. 
And he's, he's saying to Christians then, and God says to Christians now, if you don't think you need forgiveness, you're fooling yourself. The Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. I, I like to change the wording, and I think it bears... I think it bears this paraphrase. Forgive us our sins in the same way that we forgive others. False teachers of the day didn't think they were capable of sinning. They're too smart to sin. They've got it all figured out. Just recategorize it. It Makes life a whole lot easier. We'll call it a choice or a lifestyle. (laughs) We, We can live above sin. I believe it's possible. It's like that, it's like the goal for every believer. We are never going to be sinless, but we can purpose in our lives to live above sin. What's that mean? Is we we may sin, but it doesn't have to destroy our lives. If we think that we're perfect and, and incapable of sinning, we're fooling ourselves, but yet the other extreme can get us in trouble too, where we think, what's the use? And in a way, that's what these false teachers were doing. That doesn't matter. Just live any way we want. John says, that isn't what following Jesus is all about. And then verse 9 is one that we, we hear a lot, and uh, it's used a lot of times in, in as, you know, bringing people to Christ. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Verse 8 was admitting the sinful nature. Verse 9 is doing something about it. And this is often used when we're asking people to come to Christ or doing an altar call, an invitation. We'll quote this verse. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just. We'll give our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's true. But that's not who he was writing to. He was writing to Christians. He's writing to the church. Reminding them that If and when we sin, he will forgive you and cleanse us. Thank God. Thank God. That's that living relationship with Jesus. But you see, if we don't stay in the light of the truth, we can get off to the side. And we can just kind of do our thing. And, And these false teachers in John's day here toward the close of the first century were saying it doesn't matter. John said, yes, it does matter. Because the, the more you walk in darkness, the more you will act like what goes on in dark places. You've got to recognize your sin. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this is not a... This is not like beat you up until you confess something. <laughs> We've heard preaching like that, Right? But it's just a fact. We have to confess this. If we don't confess it before holy God, there can't be forgiveness. Does that mean you lose your salvation? No, I don't think so. But but it takes us away from walking in the light. We can't just say, well, that's just the way I am. No. That's not what living for Jesus is. It's saying this is the way I was, or this, this is what my old flesh wants to do. But I'm believing that God's going to lift me up above that. Amen. See, an unbeliever can get away with saying that's just the way I am. But a believer can't. A believer can't. As long as you're not talking about preferences. Like, I like seafood. I don't like seafood. I like pizza. I don't like pizza. I like Coke over Pepsi. I like pews over chairs. I like hymns over the newer contemporary songs. That's preference. We've made too much a deal over that kind of stupid stuff. God is faithful. God is faithful to forgive, and he's faithful to cleanse. Again, writing to Christians, then speaking to Christians now. Verse 10 says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. If you say, I've never, ever sinned, you're lying, and you can't be a child of God. In your natural 
unsaved condition, saying, I don't need Jesus, that says, I have nothing to be forgiven of. Verse 8 admits the sinful nature. Verse 9 is doing something about it. Verse 10 is admitting the actual act of sinning. At some point, right, you did something that needs to be forgiven. Pretty arrogant to come away from this and, and to say, I've never sinned. These false teachers in 85, 90 AD were saying that same thing, that there's no such thing as sin. If there's no such thing as sin, there's no need for forgiveness. If there's no need for forgiveness, there's no need of a Savior, no sacrifice, no atonement. Everything is spiritual and the physical doesn't matter. We see this today. Well, I'm spiritual. Which spirit? In a couple of weeks, we're going to cover that. Many spirits have gone out into the world. We are to be discerning of the spirits and to test the spirits to see if they are of God. We're surrounded by spirits. They're not all God. Can't you see today's parallels with what was written here almost 2,000 years ago? So what do we do? How do we identify false teachers? How do we make sure we're not overly critical of someone that maybe just says something that's a little different or, or just something we don't understand? Well, here, here's a couple of things we can remember. Righteousness and holiness is unimportant. If it's unimportant to live uh, like Jesus or to walk in the light of God, if, if holiness is unimportant, if we just say one thing and do another, if, if your intellect is more important than your relationship with God, if you're always looking after something new and different, well, then that might be a red flag. If someone says the scripture is not to be taken seriously, at least not as serious as my own superior knowledge, right? That's a red flag. That there's no need for atonement, that Christ didn't have to die, that he did not have to shed his blood. When, when he diminished the work of Christ, when you say that it wasn't a physical death that he died, Everything was useless what Jesus went through. That's a red flag. And if everything material is evil, so God couldn't have created the universe, God could never have become a man, that's a red flag. Because I'm a Christian, but I can live any way I want with anyone I want any way I want. The Word of God is just another book. Jesus is no more than a good teacher. The cross was unnecessary, and Jesus is just one way to God. If those things find their way into some teaching, it's false. Not everything that sounds religious is of God. Not everything that sounds spiritual is the right spirit. Not everything that is new is true. People are too quick to put their faith in what a 23-year-old entertainer thinks about God and too slow to place their hopes in the gospel that the apostles died gruesome deaths for proclaiming. Now, I have nothing against 23-year-old entertainers, but just because they're famous doesn't mean they're right. Let's not dismiss 2,000 years of church history. Let's not dismiss 2,000 years of experience and, and tradition for something new and different. Let's not belittle the lives of those people who gave themselves for the sake of the gospel in order to look more intelligent. You know, having received a degree in something that didn't exist four years ago, The apostles walked with Jesus. They saw firsthand his miracles. They experienced what it was like to walk with them. Can you just imagine? And they looked forward to a day that they couldn't imagine that we can have now, is that the Holy Spirit of the living God can live in us. And, and, and just think about what some people before 
Calvary and Pentecost thought about if they, they could never imagine what we have available to us today, this side of Calvary and Pentecost. Amen. And too many of us just sit around and talk about a nice service, or I don't like that song, or I can't believe that church is doing this. Unwilling to investigate based on the Word of God, if maybe what that other church is doing, it's just different, that's all. I've seen it. I've seen it over the last 40 years. I've seen people trash other people that, that have no idea what's going on. You'll hear people trashing moves of God today because they look different, because they don't meet in a building that looks like a church, because they spend an hour and a half in worship before they get to the Word. Well, I don't think that's... Doesn't make it wrong. And dismiss the stuff that they should be against. Denying who Christ is. Denying the born-again experience. Denying the need to live a holy life. Denying the power of the Holy Spirit. The apostles who walked with Jesus, the early church fathers. If you've, if you've not ever done some research, there's names like Irenaeus and Polycarp and Clement and Jerome and Ignatius and Justin Martyr. These were people, and more throughout the centuries, who, who were so convinced and so dedicated to the gospel when it wasn't popular to be a Christian. And most of them walked to their deaths rather than recant their faith in Jesus. And now we live in this society that everybody's illumined and everybody's intelligent and everybody has this knowledge, you know, that's smarter than them. Oh, please. <laughs> Beware of people that set out to prove you wrong on everything. Yes. Don't, get, don't hate them. Don't get mad at them. But listen, sometimes you have to question the motives of those who claim to know everything but have little life experience to show for it. We have to trust God, trust His Word, and walk in the light. I wonder if the team would come. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to wonder. We, we don't have to be fearful about what we see going on around us. We have the Word of God. We have the true church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of what we see on the news, you know, I remember an Amish person telling me that um, they had very little COVID in their community. And I said, why? He said, because we don't have TV. <laughs> Sometimes maybe we just need to turn it off and, and stay in something that is eternal. And that is the Word of God. Let Him speak to your heart. Let the Holy Spirit take charge of your life <laughs> and say, Lord, I know all the bad stuff that's out there, and I know all the conflicting teaching that's out there. God, keep me from being used in a critical spirit whenever I encounter something that's a little different, but help me to rightly discern false teaching when it contradicts who Jesus is, when it contradicts why Jesus came what he accomplished. When we get into those issues, we need to protect ourselves from it. And we will never have to worry. We are not made. I mean, Paul said, writing to the Thessalonians, right, about the second coming of Christ. What did he say? I would not have you be ignorant about these things. There's need, no need for us to be ignorant about what God has for his children.